Hello and welcome to another episode of Rewildology, the show that explores conservation, travel, and rewilding the planet. I'm your host, Brooke Mitchell Norman, conservation biologist and adventure traveler. Whoa, October came and went so freaking quickly. It was another fun month of never before tried episode styles, new topics, repeat topics, but more in depth, and a whole visual tour across Madagascar to meet the island's lemurs. In case you missed an episode or were on the fence about listening to the full thing, check out these clips to see if you might want to go back and listen to it in its entirety. All right, here we go. First in October, we sat down with Andrew Metter, biomimicry expert and an educator at the Biomimicry Institute. So what are some of your favorite examples of biomimicry that's like from all the way down, like the, the species and maybe how it was discovered and then how we're applying it? I would love to hear some different mm -hmm. ideas of how we're doing this. I think the most ubiquitous example that anyone could understand would be Velcro. Mm. Velcro really is the the first widespread, wide scale manufacturing biomimetic innovation. And there is a, a scientist and just a curious person who went out walking with his dog and he noticed these burrs that had these kind of hooks stuck on the dog's fur. And he was initially annoyed by it because he had to clean them off. You know, then there's a mess when he got home, but he put them under a microscope and he noticed this hooking structure. And so that that specific form, so he was copying the shape, the form of this plant strategy to spread its seeds. And one thing I would say is we can look to nature and we can learn from nature. We can learn a lot of things. I think some of the most exciting lessons from nature are simple physics and chemistry lessons. And so one of my favorite examples with birds is the Shinkansen bullet train. So there was this bullet train in Japan that was entering tunnels and because it was traveling at high speeds, pressure waves in the air were building up on the nose. And then when the tu tunnel inevitably ended, the pressure waves would expand, it would create a sonic boom, hmm. and it was very disruptive to the communities and you know to the animals that were nearby too. The lead engineer happened to be a bird watcher, and he thought back, and as he was watching a kingfisher, a kingfisher has a beak that slips into the water nearly without splashing, and it's able to catch fish. And he saw that, and he thought, okay, so this is entering without creating waves. So how can our train enter a tunnel without creating waves? And this is also a really important lesson in biomimicry that I like to explain. It's not just copying and pasting a beak onto the front of a train. That still falls short of learning from nature because in doing that, you've not understood the physical principles of why the beak accomplishes its function. So what they did was they performed hydraulic studies, aerodynamics studies on the beak to figure out how is nature, how is the kingfisher doing this? How can we take this lesson instead of just the shape and how can we apply it to our train situation? And so when they did that, it saved, you know, 13% more electricity, travel times got cut down. There were all these residual side effects for sustainability that were good for business too, because they took the time to notice this amazing animal. Oh, that's wonderful. Do you have any more examples that you love to share? I could, I, I could listen to these all day. <laughs> Do you have any more? Um, <laughs> I would say one more strategic example is a company called New Iridium. And because of my chemistry background, I'm very passionate about green chemistry. And even from going through a chemistry program, that was never a consideration in the classes that I took that were required for my degree. Mm -hmm. It was never end of life considerations for the chemicals we're using. It's always, you know, kind of, how can you be a good little industrial chemist and not rock the boat? Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously I, I'm adding a little bit of narrative there. However, that's, that's true to my experience and how it felt. And so New Iridium is this company that's inspired by the way that plants are able to photosynthesize. So they're converting solar energy into chemical or food energy. And they've created photocatalysts. So photocatalysts catalyze reactions by absorbing light energy. And why this is so important, especially in green and sustainable chemistry, is because there's a saying called heat, beat, and treat. So 
We heat things to outrageously unnatural temperatures to conduct reactions. We beat them together, harsh collisions that aren't found in nature. Nature uses enzyme-like reactions, which are very uh, complementary. They fit together by shape. They're not just kind of figure eight demolition derby, crashing the molecules together to make the reaction happen, and then treating them with harmful synthetic chemicals to accomplish a purpose. So new iridium was inspired by how plants are able to leverage energy from the sun to photosynthesize, to go through their photosystems. And if you ever go outside and you touch a plant, it might be warm, but it's not going to burn you like many of our industrial chemical vats that exist in the chemical industry would. And so that's a really great innovation. That's a, that's a little more specific and requires a little bit more knowledge of science than just saying we put a beak on a train. But it's nonetheless very important for the future of humanity for us to be able to leverage natural energies without heating, beating, and treating and inputting all this excess energy, which is often tied to fossil fuels that's releasing stored carbon back into the atmosphere. And yeah, so they've created these proprietary catalysts that absorb energy from sunlight, and then that catalyzes the reaction. Next up, we sat down with Tinka Plege, one of the pioneers in sloth conservation. So from your experience, could you kind of give us a synopsis or maybe the journey? How has sloth conservation changed throughout your decades in the field? Well, look, uh, there are those professional currents in conservation biology that the uh, individual who comes out from the forest it is not representative for the conservation. Here in Colombia, you still find nowadays those types of thoughts. But I think we always have to open up our mind and look at other living beings from a very different point of view. They are living beings the same as, as we are. How much do we need to learn and study in order to understand the situation? in order to understand those other living living beings and helping them. You know, every year, thousands and thousands of wildfowl, among them lots of course, and other senators, they come out from the forest. Many of them die, but then still there are many who survived. So are we going to keep all of them in the captivity that we can never have the same as in the forest, or we have to change, you know, our point of view and look at them through a very different perspective. One of the, of the very big things, that, and especially veterinarians, they love to talk about uh, zoonosis. Of course, each of us have our micro flora and fauna, <laughs> very abundant, and it is in perfect equilibrium. When we don't have it in equilibrium, then we start feeling bad. Well, the same is with animals. So if the animals, in this case, transfer their diseases to us, what are these diseases or vectors or microorganisms, all types of them that we transfer to them? So we cannot anymore look and think that we are the only potent human beings and that everything turns around us. I think the mother nature, Gaia, uh, the earth is telling us, hey, my dears, okay, you keep on thinking like that. And somehow nowadays I have to defend from you. So all of us are complaining nowadays because of global warming. But what have we done so far in all these uh, last decades in order to start solving the problem? Because the problem is not easy to solve it from today until tomorrow. Not on a very global level, that it failed because it, on the global level, it has been for decades trying to do something, but doing something on the everyday life. Each of us, I think we can do very much. And then you come again, of course, to the animals. You know, the animals come to the big cities because people from the big cities feeling alone 
all this jungle of uh, concrete and asphalt from the vacations when they come. And here in Colombia, they like to come with a little pet, with a little tiny plush living toy. And that's why slots, for example, and especially a three dog slot, they are personal living plush toys. But people do not understand that they are living beings, that they were taken from the mother chest, that they were exposed to all type of mistreatments, that they were stored in places without any hygiene. And finally, they were exposed to the edges of the roads, generally, to, to sell them. And if that is not enough, when they are sold, because traffickers say, oh, they are pursued pets for you, and that is not the truth. And they say, <clears throat> The, the traffickers, you just open your refrigerator and whatever you find in your refrigerator, that is that uh, the animal eats. And that is everything but the truth. So people bring them to the big cities. They realize very, very soon that what they were told has nothing to do with the real situation. Very, very soon, a lot in this case, they start showing that they are sick. When a wild animal shows to you that they are sick, they are already very sick. So there is not very much what you can do, even, even though if you would love to, to help them, but if somebody is already so bad, well, there is not very much you can do it. So that is generally the situation that you live here, that, that you live in the whole Amazon basin and the countries all around the Amazon Basin, you find a similar situation or even worse in Central America, in certain countries in Central America, because they have illegal trafficking for tourism. So you have, you have double danger for, for the animals. On the other hand, people are very amazed with slots, uh, they are tender, loving creatures. Uh, they inspire us very, uh, very much. But I think it is a hypocrisy. We are saying that, but we do not understand. We don't want really to understand that. Well, in the world, each of us have a certain space where we live and the function that we fulfill and we want to fulfill. The same is with white fauna. Their, their place is in the forest. They fulfill a very important function. And if you want to make the, the circle completely closed, indirectly, the same as other wild fauna, uh, as well as flora, they contribute to the making the, all these troubles about the global heating uh, less visible. So if we don't understand, we are contributing to our own extinction if we really want to keep on being very anthropocentric. So when we started working with clouds at the very beginning, late 90s, uh, first years of this century, we were rescuing clouds door to door, uh, trying to, to talk with people and make them aware that they uh, are not doing something uh, good. Uh, people would uh, treat us really very bad. They would tell us, I bought this animal and this animal is mine. So I can do whatever I want with that animal. Well, the result was a dead animal. And most of them come to the big cities with a very short age. There were situations where the animals were coming to, to Medellin, the second biggest city, in the first month of their, of their life. So throughout our, uh, you know, educational processes, door to door, person to person, and later, you know, making conferences, uh, workshops, and, and, and so, so on. Nowadays, you find very many people, they are aware that you cannot think like that and you cannot do it in such a way. Uh, within big cities, nowadays, you find people who go and bring those animals to the big cities, you find generally the neighborhood, those who call the authorities and 
called us in case of uh, slots, uh, editors, and armadillos, saying, hey, look, but this person in such and such place, they have a wild animal, please do something. So in terms of quantifying, we cannot quantify it, but in terms of changing the attitude of people, we can say it's changed significantly. So I think it is really very important. Third in October, we brought back one of the show's first guests, Daniela Shusid, PhD, to share both her professional and personal updates that have occurred since we last sat down over a year ago. So yeah. let's go back to Zambia. When we were yeah, chatting good. last and catching up, you told me some crazy stories about like these elephant coloring experiences, like going out and coloring them. Like share some of these stories with people listening. Oh, yeah. It sounded wild. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. So I was really nervous. I'm a, I'm a talker. I, I'm chatty all the time. I could talk anybody's ear off. And we're doing like, little videos and capturing every aspect, right? So we could put something together and there's this and this. And I was asked, how are you feeling right now? And I had zero words because <laughs> I was so nervous. So we were, we collared actually on my birthday was day one. So we could talk about that too, because it was fantastic uh, yeah, being on my cool. birthday. Uh, but it was right at the end of the rainy season and the beginning of the dry season. And the rains, we're kind of a little late still, so we're having some rains here and there in April. And in Zambia, where I work, there are some plains, but there's also like a lot of thickets. So it's not a rainforest, but it is wooded areas. And I was quite concerned that we were going to find elephants because it was still so green and lush. So I was nervous, right? Like a lot is riding on this. First off, it's expensive and it's such an ordeal. So we're, we're working with a helicopter, again, because of the environment, also the elephants. So the elephants I work with in Kafui, they're not comfortable around vehicles. So I'd say, oof, man, at least, at least once, if not twice a week, and I feel like that's a very conservative number I'm giving you, we get mock charged by elephants in the vehicle when we're going out for research. They, yeah, that's scary. Yeah, they just, I mean, <laughs> the history, it's, I mean, that's you, you kind of yeah. get used to it which is a good and a bad thing, but you also, you know, you're reading the elephant, right? So it's not like we're totally green out there and we don't know what to expect and we don't know what the elephant is telling us. So, I mean, we're very, I think, appropriately safe in terms of how we handle it, but you kind of also have come to expect it in certain contexts. But anyway, for those reasons, we are darting elephants from a, from a helicopter. And when I say me, are we, I mean the principle that of the Department of National Parks and Wildlife for Zambia. So he's the one doing the darting. And yeah, so day one, we have the helicopter, the helicopter, it's coming from South Africa. They're not in Zambia, right? And we go up and it's just, I mean, the feeling was unbelievable. I can't put it into words. And just also seeing the landscape from that perspective, you just, I mean, it's, Unreal. It's unreal. And the way it is for the, the project, because I want to match our orphans to wild elephants, I had a specific idea of where I wanted us to color these elephants and sex ratio of these elephants. So I wanted five females and one subadult male. And it is, it's a bit different to, to identify the sex of an elephant from above than it is <laughs> when you're on the ground. And so I was I was a bit nervous because again, my first time and, and didn't want to misidentify. So it's my call. I say, this is the elephant that we're darting. We communicate, right? And then Tristan, who is our pilot and Dr. Innocent, the vet, then they know what it is. Tristan maneuvers the helicopter in such a way that sets up Dr. Innocent for success with darting the elephant. And I do just want to take a brief pause and say the elephant's welfare is always first and foremost in these situations, right? We do not go after elephants that have young calves. We don't want to put those babies in bad situations where they could get lost from mom or something might happen to them. So we're going after very specific individuals. And anytime we think that it might be 
risky. We pull up and and we're out of there. And in fact, we we did do that a couple of times. We're just like, this isn't this isn't a great situation. So they communicate, and then innocent is is darting the elephant from the helicopter. We're monitoring the elephant from above, and then once we see the elephant is down, we go out there, and you have to make sure the elephant is in a right position. So that's laying on her side, right? And she's able to breathe and we open up her trunk. We're monitoring her, her stats, like her heart rate, her breathing. Great. And then the team is at it. And I think the fastest we did, which I was very proud of, was about 12 and a half minutes. We put a GPS collar on the elephant and we took every biological sample that we wanted. And that was blood, uh, kind of like a snot sample for lack of a better term. <laughs> tissue. So tissue sample, ticks, body measurements, and, uh, and dog. I think that might be every, oh, and a tail hair, right? So we have a great team. The team is, is myself and folks with Game Rangers International. We had someone from Elephant Connection that was helping us with capacity building and learning about collaring the elephants. And obviously we did some things before we went out, um, but it was just awesome teamwork and just that whole situation. And for me, it was one of those things like on my, I don't want to say bucket list, but something professionally that I always wanted to to reach. Like there's a few things. The other one's like a field vehicle and I have a field vehicle now. Her, <laughs> her name is M. Cyrus after Miley Cyrus because she's a badass, just like Miley Cyrus is. Like the vehicle's a badass, so it's Miley Cyrus. Uh, so those two things happened this year, which were, yeah, something for me that I was always trying to or for whatever reasons, probably like as like younger Daniela looking at other field biologists and researchers and what they're doing. And, and to me, that seemed like, yeah, that's, that's like a, like a little feather in your cap. It's like, it's like a, okay. it's like a next career level, like an accomplishment. It's like, yes, yeah, like, yeah. I'm so legit that I now have my own <laughs> yeah. car, like Miley Cyrus. I'm going to be riding with her every single day. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's pretty. She's a beautiful, beautiful vehicle. Oh, she's great. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of like a brief overview of it, of the situation and, and it was just so cool. So, so cool. Lastly, in October, we released a brand new and super fun episode style with Lynn Vinart, co-founder of the Lemur Conservation Network. To celebrate World Lemur Day, Lynn took us on a full tour across Madagascar to meet the species and people she's come to love. This comes to the next big segment of our conversation. So we have covered conservation tourism quite extensively on this podcast because it is one of my biggest ethos. It's one of my biggest, I believe in it so much as a solution. Because just like you said, so so many things that this one concept or this one field can help with, and that is, you said that Madagascar is one of the poorest countries. Well, (laughs) conservation tourism is a direct way of bringing money to the country and also protecting the beautiful green spaces that's still there where these amazing species of lemurs live. So it's all wrapped up in one. And also, since I actually am, I work professionally in the field, Madagascar is starting to get onto the radar of a lot of people's just, I think I'm my my next bucket list, you know, so many people have gone to Africa, they've gone to these other destinations, and they're like, where should we go next? And then as more documentaries come out, you know, the BBC has been fantastic of creating some of the most gorgeous Madagascar documentaries I've ever seen. And once you see those images, you're like, oh my gosh, this needs to be saved. This needs to be, these people need opportunity. How do we make opportunity? Well, let's give them real jobs. Let's give them everything that we possibly can as tourists and people that are, you know, conservation minded. How can we help? And this is a way that we can help. We can go see these animals. And with that, I have not had the opportunity to see them myself, but it's high on the list. And you have. You have yes. gone multiple times. You have been to these areas. You've been to these parks. You've seen these species. You've done all these experiences and met the communities. And so could you possibly take us there? Take me with you. I'm currently going to be in a plane. Oh, <laughs> I don't even know the airline that flies there, but let's say we're on Delta right now. We are going over to Madagascar. So I'm in the seat with you. Take me on a tour. What is it like yes. to experience Madagascar? Awesome. Definitely. 
I'm going to share my screen so that the viewers on YouTube can uh, experience some of these. Yes, and everyone listening, I will have timestamps as well of every single slide. So if you're driving, it is okay. Just come back to the show notes and we will make sure that you are able to see this, this amazingness. <laughs> yes. So as I mentioned, you know, there's, there's 112 species of lemur in Madagascar. Mm -hmm. So well, if you're planning a trip to Madagascar, you're probably not going to see 112. So you want to focus on what are the things you want to see the most? Are there a certain species that you're super excited about? Are there certain places? Are you more into the rainforest? Or do you want to experience the Singhi, which is this photo here in Ankarana National Park? Oh, it's Singhi. Like, what are we looking yeah, at? Yeah, so this is, there's a few different Singhi parks in Madagascar. So, and they, it's limestone pinnacles, like limestone rock formations that come out of the ground in these like karst landscapes. And they're pretty crazy. And the lemurs, you know, I think you've probably seen these on some of the BBC documentaries or, yes. you know, and you can see like the lemurs jumping between the ragged cliffs and, you know, licking their toes because they maybe like got stuck on a pointy rock face. But this is like a super cool landscape to go visit. And there's the Ankarana, which is this one in the north. And then there's also the Singhi de Bemaraha in the west, which is the, the, the grand Singhi, the huge one. And then there's also dry forest in the southwest and the, also just in general in the west part of the country. Baobabs are, you know, Madagascar is also really known for baobabs and they are amazing. I have not yet been to the alley of baobabs, but that is, I've seen so many amazing pictures of that where it's sort of an alleyway of just like majestic baobabs on all sides. But this is, in a lot of the parks on the western side, you'll be able to see baobabs in all different species. And you also see Madagascar, Malagasy people love rice. It's one of their main diet staples. And a lot of people eat rice three times a day. And, or most Malagasy people actually, I think, eat rice three times a day. And so you'll see as you're driving throughout the country, sort of terraced landscapes where people are growing rice. And it's interesting in, in Madagascar, as you're driving around and experiencing the different areas, there's 18 different tribes that live in Madagascar. So, and they all vary on their dialect of the Malagasy language, but also the different architecture styles that some of them have different clothing styles. And so they're all like unique cultures. So it's a really interesting place to go, not just for the landscapes and the wildlife, but to experience Malagasy people and the very unique cultures in different parts of the country. So you could go to, you know, some of the areas I'll show you today have totally different cultures too. So, and I always, I mean, I come from an art background, so I always find the architecture of the houses in different areas super interesting. And that is it, a snapshot of October's wide-ranging episodes. Hopefully one of the clips piqued your interest enough to go back and listen to the full episode. I know we'll sure be happy if you did. <laughs> As always, we want to thank you for being a part of the Rewildology community. If you would like to support the show in other creative ways, there are several ways to do so. Some zero-cost ways include subscribing to the podcast on your favorite streaming app, leaving a rating and review to boost the algorithm, which will present the podcast to more listeners, signing up for the weekly Rewildology newsletter at the website, subscribing to the YouTube channel, and following the show on your favorite social media app. If you'd like to financially support the show and help us keep these stories on the airwaves, consider making a monetary donation at Rewildology.com or purchase a piece of swag to show off your Rewildology love. At least 10% of proceeds from this podcast will be donated to our conservation partners. I'd also like to extend a special thanks to Heather Valley, the show's audio and video producer, for making the show sound and look awesome, and Focusrite for powering the podcast sound. If you'd like to see the Focusrite gear we use to record the show, head on over to rewildology.com and check out Nature Podcasting under the Resources tab. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet. Hey, thanks again for listening to this episode of Rewildology. If you like what you heard, hit that subscribe button to never miss a future episode. Do you have a cool environmental organization, travel story, or research that you'd like to share? Let me know at rewildology.com. 
Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet. <laughs>